Hey, welcome to Ones and Zeros. My name is Ben, and today we are taking a look at episode seven of our FPGA basic series. In this episode, we're going to do a fairly simple one where we basically take a bit of a look at configuring inputs and outputs. Not so much from when we set up a module, but from the actual hardware side of things. So there'll be certain situations where that will be something that you may need to do. So if we jump over to our camera, um, in the case of our D0 CV board and also this board, which we haven't yet featured on this series, which is a D1 SOC board, those guys are fairly simple to get set up when you first go to create a project in Quartus, um, simply because we can actually select the board from the list and it will actually configure the hardware inputs and outputs to match the board configuration. When we take a look at certain other boards like this guy here, um, which is basically a cheaper knockoff version of the DE0, um, or something like this where it's basically just a third party board, um, you may get sample projects and things like that provided with the board, or you may not. Um, in certain cases, you may either get just the schematics or the uh, like a spreadsheet showing the actual uh, pins that various things are connected to and it'll be up to you to actually go through and connect the inputs and outputs and that can be something that's really useful to know how to do especially if you want to save yourself a little bit of money and go with one of the cheaper options because these are still quite useful good boards maybe not as good a documentation and as good a, a quality as some of the stuff from the more well-known manufacturers. Um, but I've still done quite a lot of stuff with this board in particular that, um, for example, the, the first working CPU design that I put in an FPGA and actually got it running with a bunch of peripherals was done on this one. Um, you may, just, may notice this guy is hooked up a little bit different than with the Terasic board simply, simply because we do need to have the USB blaster because it doesn't have one of those built in. Um, but other than that, it's basically the same because the USB blaster is just on board with these guys. So you just plug the USB straight into the board. Um, in the case of this particular board, which is the one we're going to have a look at in today's video, there was a few details that were provided um, when I got hold of that board. Um, it does come with schematics. Um, however, unfortunately, they're not the best schematics and they don't actually list the particular pins that the various peripherals are connected to in the schematic itself. Um, still useful for actually figuring out, you know, what's hooked up where and um, what sort of circuit design they're actually using for some of the different peripherals. But as far as setting up the actual pins, um, what I needed to do was actually have a look through the spreadsheet that was provided. So if we jump over to our screen, we can have a bit of a look at that one. So in the case of this one, um, basically see that it goes through and lists the various different things that are connected up to the FPGA, our PS2, LEDs, our push buttons, our reset button and our clock signal, things like that. And then it just lists the actual pin number that those are connected to. So we need to go through and actually translate that into something in our Quartus project so that when we go to create, say, a top level module, we can get everything connected up so that the signals are going to go to the right pins on the FPGA so that everything works correctly. So we've got a quarter set up here. We're just going to create a blank project. So open up our new project wizard. And we're just going to chuck this guy on the desktop. Let's just create a folder for that one. And we'll just call that inputs and outputs. That will be the folder for that one. And then we'll just call the project inputs and outputs. We want an empty project. We're not going to add any files just yet. This is where it starts to get a little bit different. So for the 
D0CV board that we've used in previous episodes. Um, as you've seen, we can go into board and simply select that guy from the list. We can't really do that in this situation. Um, so it's a matter of actually going through and selecting the particular device that we're going to be working with. And then the rest of the configuration is kind of going to be up to us. So in the case of this one, the particular chip that we're working with is a Cyclone 4E series device. So we're going to select Cyclone 4E and then it'll give us a list down the bottom if we expand this out a bit like so. And we're looking for the EP4C no, where are we? EP4CE6 E22C6 so EP4CE6 E22C6 which matches the particular FPGA chip that's on that board um, and that is contained in the schematics it does have the actual chip number as well as it had that on the actual eBay listing when I purchased it as well so I was able to do a bit of research into it prior to that it does tell us how many logic elements we've got, um, how many inputs and outputs, GP, uh, memory bits, all of that sort of stuff as well. One of the things that you'll notice is a little bit different with this one as opposed to our Cyclone 5 on the Terasic board is where we have adaptive, adaptive logic modules on that one because it's a Cyclone 5 chip. This one being a Cyclone 4 uses logic elements which is similar, um, but a logic element contains slightly less functionality than an adaptive logic module. Still got the similar approach to combinational logic and registers in them, um, just less stuff per logic element as opposed to an adaptive logic module. Um, the other difference is the fact that we've got embedded multipliers as opposed to DSP blocks. So a couple of different differences there, as well as um, only two PLLs as opposed to the four that we would have seen in the PLL video. So select that one. We're not going to worry about setting up tool settings at the moment. And we're just going to finish. And it will go through and create the project for us. So just give it a moment to finish that one. And if we go to our project navigator up the top left there and select files, we can see unlike when we create a new project for the DE0, this guy doesn't actually put any files in there whatsoever when we first start up. So we're going to create all of that from scratch as well. So we're going to create a Verilog file and let's pop in Might help if I copy and paste correctly. Pop in our little header bit there. Create the top level module just to rough things out so that that's going to be ready to go for us. Fix up the date. What's the date today? 26th. And we can see that I have also put in the particular device that we're working with here as well, so that um, at a glance, I can see that from the headers in the files. So we're gonna save this one. We'll save this as the same name as our top level module. So QA main and QA main, save that guy, and then go over to the file we've just created in the navigator, right click it and tell it we're setting that as the top level entity. So that is that part set up, but we can't just go through and start creating our inputs and outputs in the module because we've got to define what pins they're actually being connected to in hardware, which is the point of the episode. So up the top here, we're going to see this guy, which is our pin planner. If we click on that and it'll actually open this guy up, which you may have seen in one of the previous episodes, but we didn't really go through and configure anything with it. We'll see the actual chip and with this one being an LQPF device, we've got all of the pins around the outside of the chip. Now to start getting things set up, we 
I find it easier to do most of this down in the list here. So we'll start with a couple of the signals that we know we're going to be working with. We're not going to add all of them in this video, just the ones so that we can actually test it and make sure that things are actually working. And first thing we're going to do is add the reset signal, which we're going to name reset underscore n. This node name will be the same as the name that we use when we go to assign that input or output inside our top level module. So reset n, click on location, and that is connected to uh, pin number 25. So if I just type 25 in there, it'll automatically change that to pin 25, and we can just hit enter. Now, one of the things that you'll notice in here is the I.O. standard. Um, this one's currently set to 2.5 volt input output, which we don't want. We're actually going to be wanting 3.3 volts. So we'll just double click on that. And we're going to want 3.3 volts LVTTL, which is the standard we're going to be using. You will see there's quite a fair few different options there. This is the one that I typically use for most of the stuff that I'm working with, but it does depend on what you're actually connecting the pins to. This is a fairly safe bet. Um, most of the stuff that I work with is going to be 3.3 volt and TTL logic. So we don't want to have to go and change the IO standard for all of the pins as we add them. So the way to fix that up is we'll just close our pin planner. We're going to go to our project navigator, change it to hierarchy. We've got our actual device here, our chip. And we're going to right click on that, go to device. And if we drag over the window that pops up, one of the options that we didn't have when we were selecting the chip during project setup was the device and pin options. So we have that now, so we can click on that. That'll open up this window. And then there's a bunch of different options in here. The one we're interested in is the voltage, and we're going to set the default I.O. standard to 3.3 volts LVTTL, which means that as we go to add the inputs in the pin planner, it's automatically going to set those as the I.O. standard that we're looking for. Now, the next one that we might add is this board does also have a crystal on it that can provide a clock signal that we can use. Um, we're going to name that one, it's a 50 megahertz clock, so we'll go with a similar naming standard as to what is what we normally use with the Teresic board. So we're just going to call that clock 50 so that we know what frequency it is, and that one is connected to pin 23. So again, just pop 23 in there and it'll automatically fill out the other details. You can also um, change things like their current strength and things like that as well. Um, we're just going to go with the 8 milliamps. That will perfectly suit what we're doing with it. We'll also have a bit of a mess with the push buttons and the LEDs on the board just so that we can test it and make sure it's actually doing something. Um, and that the way we've set things up is actually working. So let's go through and do our push buttons first. Now we're going to do these as an array and the way we do that is by putting the name in and then the square brackets with the array index in here. So this will be key zero for the first key on the board and that is set up to location or pin number 88. I'm going to go with key number one. That's going to pin 89. Key two, which is going to pin 90. And key three is going to pin 91. We'll also pop our LEDs in there as well. So we'll go with LED. Again, we'll do these as an array of four because there's four of them on the board. That is connected to pin 87. One of the things that I do recommend as well is once you've got a project set up with all of your pin IO configuration and stuff like that, you can go through and use that as a template. Um, 
to be able to not have to do that every time you go to set up a project. So give yourself a bit of a starting point so that effectively if you get a board and you have to do pin configuration you're only going to have to do it once rather than doing it every time so LED2 and LED3 which is 84 it is excellent so we've got our reset signal our clock our four push buttons and our four LEDs that are on this board um, we could go through and do the SD RAM and the seven segment displays and all of that sort of stuff, but it's basically just more of the same. So, so that you don't have to sit there and watch me type in all of them, we're just going to have a bit of a mess around with the um, inputs and outputs that we've got here. There is also this direction option. Now, no need to worry about that at the moment because when we go to actually start setting those up in the module, we we'll be able to come back in the pin planner and it will have actually filled that out depending on what we've defined in the module. So we'll have a bit of a look at that as well. So I'm just going to pop that off to the side at the moment so I can actually reference it while we start getting the module done. So we've got our first input which is reset N, our reset signal which is active low. That should be a comma after that, not a semicolon. We've got clock 50, which is our clock signal. Got our push buttons. So that'll be three colon zero in square brackets because it's an array of four. And we're just gonna call that key and then we've got an output which is an array of four as well which will be our leds so we'll just call that guy led tidy this stuff up a little bit obviously mess something up because our input and output keywords haven't turned blue here I'm not sure why. Let's just try compiling that and see if it has any complaints about that. It might just be wanting to be compiled before it figures that out. Or I've made a mistake, one of the two. All right, thought so. Let's double click. Ah. Okay, it's because I made that same silly mistake again of putting semicolon instead of commas. That's the only error that it is showing there. It's probably my most common error <laughs> working with the FPGAs is putting the semicolons at the end of the input and output lines when doing a module declaration. It's about as good as forgetting the semicolon at the end of the line when doing C++. So that's all compiling fine. And as I've just realized, these guys don't actually turn blue like I thought they did. Looking at my reference code, they're still black as well. So. Now, as I mentioned, now that we've told it what are inputs and what are outputs, if we go back into our pin planner, and just drag that guy back over here, we can actually see that it has filled out the directions here as to whether they're inputs or outputs. It will also change the order so that they're in alphabetical order. So that's all fairly normal. Well, close that one and Let's chuck a bit of code in here just to be able to test what it's actually doing. So we're just going to create a 4-bit register. We'll call it counter register and fill it with four zeros. I do find it handy having a lot more LEDs on the Terasic board as well as the fact that on this board although it has four switches and four push buttons the 
each push button is sharing a pin with one of the switches. So you can't use the switches and the push buttons independently of one another, um, which does sort of limit things a little bit as well. But again, done some pretty cool stuff with this board anyway, so I'm still a bit of a fan of it. So we're going to do an asynchronous reset there. So always uh, negative edge of reset n or positive edge of key zero so that we're clocking it with the one of the push buttons, but it also allows us to do an asynchronous reset. And again, I'll explain synchronous and asynchronous resets in a future video as well. So I'm going to go if not reset n. So if we're holding the reset button down, which because it's an active low signal, if we're holding the button down, we're going to get a zero from it. If we're not hold, not pressing it, we're going to get a one. So that's why we put the not in there. And in that case, we will reset the counter register and just fill it with four zeros. Otherwise, we will go through and actually increment it. So that we're actually getting some counting behavior out of it. And then we will assign to our LEDs our counter register so that we can see what values in counter register on the LEDs. So that should allow us to go through and test it. We haven't done anything with the clock in this case, but we do have a 50 megahertz clock and rather than go through and make you watch me setting up a PLL on stuff as we've done in previous videos, this will be enough to let us know that the board's actually working the way we want it to. So let's compile that. And we will have some other cool stuff coming up in some of the other videos in this series as well. Um, things like one of the next things I want to do is looking at setting up ROMs so that you can actually store data and access it from a ROM. And one of the cool things that we can actually do that is with that is use it as a tool to convert between binary numbers and um, the signals that we need to be able to display those numbers on the seven segment displays. So I've already got the prep work done for that video. It's just um, that one's just waiting to be filmed. So that should be coming up. If not this week, then it'll be early next week. And it'll also show you how we can use ROMs for other purposes as well. Um, we're going to be looking at RAMs and shift registers and state machines doing um, various types of arithmetic and things like that in some of the videos moving forward. So this series, we're basically want to be looking at all of the key pieces that you need to be able to put together to create a larger system effectively. So that is all compiled and ready to go. Only used four of the logic elements. Now, while we're here, um, so that you can sort of see the difference between the adaptive logic modules and the logic elements, see there's a lot less blocks on this particular chip than there is on the D0 board, um, the Cyclone 5 that we've been using on that one. Still do quite a lot with what it's got here anyway. Um, we do have a couple of the green ones are memory blocks and then we've also got the multiplier blocks which um, do hardware multiplication of binary. And as I mentioned, this one has two P PLLs. Um, so unlike the D0 board, half the amount of PLLs and I believe the PLLs on this one can generate up to four clocks rather than nine clocks per PLL on the D0 board. But if we go in here, we can see the particular logic elements that are being used. Double click on that one. And we can see that the logic element 
in here basically has one set of combinational logic and a single bit register whereas from memory the adaptive logic modules in the Cyclone 5 series have a more complex set of combinational logic that it can use as well as four registers so four single bit registers per ALM so a little bit different still really flexible you can still do a lot with a chip like this one um, but that's just so that you can see some of those differences there we'll close that one let's get this programmed onto the board so we'll open up our programmer it's currently telling us no hardware so we're going to have to select our usb blaster close that and it's already got our sof file selected for us so we can go through and hit start on that one one of the things i'm noticing is i believe the leds are actually inverted if we jump over to our camera that one um let's get a little bit closer to that one so looks like the leds are inverted you will notice it's not counting necessarily one step at a time in this case let's get those leds inverted though and we'll come back and have a look at that so jump back into our qa main and we're just going to invert our counter register as it's being sent to our leds let's quickly compile that we want to save that Now, if you've seen the latest dev blog too, there will be a couple of more advanced FPGA series that are planned as well. Um, there'll be one series where we're taking a bit of a look at connecting microcontrollers and FPGAs together so that we can use the ease of programming a microcontroller with the hardware flexibility from an FPGA and do some pretty cool stuff with that. There'll be another series that we're going to be starting where again slightly more advanced stuff but actually looking at creating a microcontroller inside an fpga so starting from actually building a working cpu developing a custom instruction set for that um, as well as all of the onboard peripherals and things like that so that we basically have our own little custom system on a chip by the end of that series so that one should be a little bit of fun as well Let's get that one programmed. That's all popped over onto the board. LEDs are off rather than on this time when it's reset. So it looks like we've fixed that issue up. And not quite working correctly it wants to be difficult so it seems that two of the LEDs oh we have three we potentially have a little bit of issue in our code let me should actually be connecting everything up properly but just to be sure we're going to pop those in there and before we recompile recompile it let's just jump into our RTL viewer and it is actually connecting up all of the LEDs. It's putting the NOT gates in as we want. Setting up our register the way we want. So 
So it could be a case of debouncing in the push buttons. Uh, the push buttons on this board have a bad habit of not always behaving correctly. May also be a slight hardware issue with this board as well. This hasn't been used in a while. Um, typically find the boards, even these sort of boards, are generally not too bad as far as um, lasting a while. So I'm guessing that's just something weird that's going on with that one. But we will just recompile this and pop it back on there. And just double check that. FPGA bugs are fun. Always. Take a whole different sort of approach than you might take with a microcontroller. Some things are, are similar, but um, some things will require you to think a little bit more outside the box than you may with a microcontroller, which I quite enjoy. It's a fun challenge. Okay, so we've reprogrammed that one. Let's see what we get this time. Something definitely not right with what we're doing there. Our reset button works though, it does clear the register. Let's have a look at all of the code works right. Let's just make sure all of the LEDs are actually working. Well, we've got a little bit of a bug. Let's have a play with it and see what's going on there. So just going to make it so that if we press the button to clock it, then it's actually just going to fill the counter register with all ones, just to make sure that our LEDs are actually lighting up correctly when we do that. Just to test that out a little bit. Could be a hardware issue, but it's typically fairly unlikely. So That's all done, so let's pop that onto the board. All programmed. And if we push the button, everything lights up. We hit reset, it clears everything. So we know the LEDs are actually working correctly. It could be Most likely, because the, the code is correct, um, and this is fairly simple code, so it's easy to know 100% whether or not it is doing the correct thing. I would be guessing it's going to be something to do with switch debouncing, or I'm just completely missing something. Um, could be something that's staring me right in the face. So as one of the benefits of the Teresic boards that we've been working with in previous episodes is the debouncing. Um, in this case, it could be that when we press the push button on this board, we're getting multiple spikes. One of the ways that we could work around that, and we'll just see if this is going to work for us, is we're going to go on positive edge of clock 50. So it's actually being clocked by our clock input. 
And then in here, we're gonna go if key zero is being pressed, then counter register is going to be equal to counter register plus 4H1. And we'll see how we go with that. Not sure if these push buttons on this board are active high or active low. Could actually have a look in here before we dump this on the board. If I jump into desktop and the document library, data sheets, FPGA, this is the EP4CE6 board. Schematic and that's this one. So this was a schematic that's actually provided with this board. Let's have a look at where are our push buttons. Okay, even has a temperature sensor that I have never used before. That's kind of cool. Turn light. Crystal resets, our oh, buttons and dip switches. That's what we want. All right, so these guys have a pull-up resistor and then become grounded whenever we push the button. So they're active low. So they're normally high due to the pull-up resistors, but when we press the button, it then grounds out that so that it then becomes a low signal when we're pushing the button. So we need to modify our code to fix that up a bit. So in here needs to be if not key zero. And I'll just recompile that. Thankfully this one being a slightly smaller device, this compiles a bit quicker than using the Teresic board. But wasn't planning on doing a little bit of debugging in this video but I'm glad that we got to do a bit of that anyway. Bear in mind that because we're running with a 50 megahertz clock, the counter is actually gonna count incredibly quickly. But as long as we see the LEDs behaving, then I will call it a win. I'll just program that to the board. That's all done. Jump over to our camera and if I hold my finger down, we should have counting at 50 megahertz. We can see never gonna be able to press it fast enough to be able to get it to count just one digit at 50 megahertz. Um, but the fact that we're getting different LED sequences with each press would show me that that, that is actually working. Um, I could alternatively hook all four LED channels up to the oscilloscope and actually view the signals and be able to confirm it that way. But based on that behavior, I'm pretty happy that it's doing what we want it to do. Reset button clears it and the fact that we've got all four LEDs on when I've got my finger down, um, because those LEDs will be going on and off at such a high rate, that would show me that it is actually doing what we want it to do, as well as the fact that we're getting a different value each time we let go of the button. So we'll call that a win. So that is how to go about actually setting up inputs and outputs. And like I said, if you've got a board that doesn't provide you with project files or the actual inputs and outputs set up for you, like this guy or like one of these guys, then you may need to go through and do that manually. And that is how you go about doing it. Like I said though, um, set it up once, just get your inputs and outputs all set up and your top level module save it as a, pro, a particular project as a template, and then 
basically just copy that anytime you want to go and develop a new project for the board because that way you're going to save yourself the hassle of having to go through and set that up every time. So I hope you found that interesting and helpful. Um, there's a bit of a look at a board that we haven't had a look at yet. Doesn't behave quite as well as the other one, which is why the other one's the one that we're using primarily. Um, but like I said, if you can't quite stretch the cost of getting something like the DE0, then one of these boards is still quite usable. Um, you just have to sort of understand some of its quirks and how to sort of work around them. And as far as doing switch debouncing and things like that in Verilog um, is something that we will have a look at in a future video. So that sort of stuff, you, you can make that work. Um, thank you to all of the wonderful people that have been watching. Um, it's great to see you seem to be enjoying the videos. Thank you for the, the likes and all of the subscribers that have joined recently. All of the really cool comments people have been leaving. And definitely thank you to both Craig and Luther, um, the current two patrons of the channel. Feel free to check out our Patreon if you're curious to find out about some of the benefits that you can get by signing up there, including being able to chat to me and the other patrons on our Discord. So I hope you have a wonderful night or day, morning, evening, whatever it is in your part of the world when you're watching this. And thanks for watching.